To kick things off and set the tone for our launch, I'm going to pass it over to youth moderators Basharo and Nina. Basharo Al Hussein is from Somalia and volunteers with the Umbrella of Hope Foundation. Nina Bina Davy is from Tanzania and she works for the International Youth Alliance of Family Planning. And she's also the FP 2020 Youth Focal Point for Tanzania. Basharo and Nina, go ahead and take it away. Hello, everyone. We're going to tell a story, and this is what it says. Ilo is a 14 year old girl from BDBD settlement in the northwest region of Uganda. Ilo and her family were displaced in the year 2017 due to the armed conflict in our hometown within South Sudan. She has been living with her twin brother and her single mother before they all got displaced. Ilo's mother was a farmer and could not only provide and could only provide um, basic needs for her children. Ilo or anyone in the family never knew anything about sexual reproductive health and rights. And while living at the camp, Ilo got her first menstruation cycle. She was playing with her friends within the camp during a school day. Ilo and her friends did not afford to attend the primary school near their camp due to the financial challenges. Ilo was scared, she was frustrated and did not share her experience with her mother. She thought she had committed a sin and had cut herself without knowing. No one was there to guide or provide her with information. No one discussed anything about menstrual cycles at the BDBD settlement. And mostly it was a taboo to speak about women issues or private parts. Ilo tore her old dress and started using it to prevent the blood flow. Her mother noticed that she was having mood swings, abusing her brother often. She noticed Ilo keeping a distance, sleeping late, and after everyone has gone to bed and visiting the toilet frequently. After three consecutive days, her mother saw pieces of used stained blood clots in the bin near the house and asked Ilo where, whether it was hers. She busted crying and swore she did nothing wrong, but the blood flowed on its own. The first thing her mother said was, Ilo, you are now a woman. You should stop playing with boys. You should keep your feet together every time. Ilo's mother never explained anything about the blood, where it came from, why she was feeling pain, why her brother did not experience the same and they were twins and why she should stay away from boys. Well, she assumed that it was a disease and it will soon go away and she'll become healthy again. Two years later, Elo is pregnant and confused about how it happened. Everyone in the camp talked about her situation and pointed fingers at her when she went to collect water or firewood in the nearby bushes. Ilo blamed herself for committing a grave mistake and her mother tried to close her indoors. Ilo had no information about pregnancy or anything about childbirth. Due to the shame and blame from the community and her mother, Ilo never attended clinics but stayed at home. A few days later, two health outreach workers from Umbrella of Hope Foundation were providing awareness raising session and counseling session from door to door and informing the refugee community about the recent open MCH within the camp and the services they provided to everyone, including adolescents, sexual reproductive health. When they met Elo and she was able to get information at her home together with her mother, she received care, help on different services she required during her nine months pregnancy until she gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Imagine if Elo's mother was educated about adolescent sexual reproductive health. What if Elo learned about adolescent sexual reproductive health immediately she arrived in the camp? What if the trained community outreach workers from Umbrella of Hope Foundation did not show up in providing sexual reproductive health services and information? What if the Umbrella of Hope did not have equipment, materials, 
or quality services to offer to poor ELO. This happens actually every day in humanitarian settings because crisis exacerbates and deteriorates uh, sexual and reproductive health, whether in an IDP camp, a refugee camp, or in a transitional settlement. Many are unfortunate, and they are not fortunate like ELO. Their situation is worse, and they never make it. Imagine if the toolkit is used effectively. We will see adolescents making informed decisions about sexual and reproductive health. We will see families communities, health providers, relevant agencies, and duty bearers working together with adolescents to reduce teenage pregnancies, promote menstrual health and hygiene, prevent STIs or HIV, reduce gender-based violence, and continuously increasing of accessing adolescents' sexual reproductive health services for all without fear or bias. Thank you very much. And we will give the floor to our colleagues, Grace, Maziko, and Oko to take us away to the next session on the roadmaps. Hello everyone. Good afternoon from this side and thank you so much Nina Bina and Sharo. That was so um, interesting. I could imagine um, the life of our dear friend and the questions in their mind. So now we move on straight to the roadmap. As you can see on our screens, uh, we have the welcome remarks and then we move on straight to plenary. So right after plenary, we will be having the breakout sessions where um, we, we all divide into our specific breakout rooms and we go through the chapters successfully. Then after that, we'll also group back and share our report and summary from each of the breakout sessions. Then we'll have a successful closing. So the breakout rooms, um, groups. You can see MENA, you can see East and Southern Africa, you can see West and Central Africa, and then Latin America and Southern America. So these are the four main breakout sessions, um, breakout groups, and we will be splitting into these groups. So I hope you are all ready and set. My colleagues, um, Grace, and Anita will join me in the Western and Central Africa English group and the others will also be joined by other youth moderators. So thank you very much, and we hope to have an interesting time. See you soon. OK, Hi, okay great. So you can see the breakout groups now on your screen. For Middle East and North Northern Africa, we have English and Arabic breakout groups available. And they'll be focusing on chapter four. That is priority ASRH in emergency activities and chapter five, going beyond health services. So for those of us joining from around the world who have interest in this and also might be working or your project and work focuses on Middle East and North Africa, this group might be ideal. Eastern and Central Africa would be looking at what have English and Swahili um, sessions and they are bilingual as well. And we'll have chapter one, the introduction, and chapter six, ASRH services and interventions. For West and Central Africa, we would have English and French breakout groups available. Also, we'll have chapter six, um, ASRH services and interventions, as well as chapter eight manager guidance notes and tools. And then for Latin America, the Caribbean and South America would have English and Spanish breakout groups available. Uh, and then we, that will focus on meaningful participation. That is chapter three and chapter seven, data for action. Yeah, so first of all, you choose your group according to your geographical relevance, toolkit content, interest, and or language preference. And if you do not choose a group, you will randomly be assigned a group. Also, if you do not, of course, yes, the breakout groups are 40 minutes discussion led by myself and other amazing youth moderators who will be joining you. And then we'll rejoin everyone to have um, 
the youth moderator provide a summary of the entire discussions, and then we move on to the closing. So I see a few questions, and uh, we'll hand over to the main moderators, and then they'll, they'll lead and provide answers to some of these questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Oko, for taking us over um, the roadmap. Uh, my name is Zainab. Uh, I'm from uh, Lebanon. I'm a public health uh, researcher and uh, um, I've worked on uh, multiple uh, projects related to adolescent sexual and reproductive health. So for this uh, plenary session, uh, Katie and I will be giving you a, a brief introduction to the ASRH toolkit using the companion uh, guide. And it will be a bit uh, interactive, so I will be asking uh, questions to Katie and to all of you. So be prepared to answer the questions using uh, the Zoom poll feature, which will appear on your screen after I ask uh, the questions. Um, so uh, Katie. Uh, many people uh, joining our lunch um, may not understand what um, the toolkit is. Uh, they might be wondering how it was revised or how to use it. Can we help them with those questions? I'm hoping that we can answer a lot of those questions and uh, using our companion guide, which is on the toolkits page on IWAG's website. And we can uh, type that in the chat box now. So as we as we look at the toolkit, um, what is the toolkit? So the ASRH toolkit for humanitarian settings. This provides practical guidance and uh, additional details on how to adapt your programming for adolescents in emergency settings. It provides more information than the interagency field manual. If you haven't heard of the interagency field manual, this is the go-to resource for sexual and reproductive health for all populations uh, in emergency settings. So the ASRH toolkit, it just focuses on adolescents and youth. And this was originally developed in 2009 by UNFPA and Save the Children. And then the IWAG ASRH subworking group began revising the ASRH toolkit in 2018 to align with changes to that interagency field manual I just mentioned. So like I said, in 2018, we started the revision process. We did a desk review and then in 2018, 2019, we did several consultations with all different ASRH stakeholders. And we uh, shared that draft revised toolkit in at the beginning of 2020. And we spent most of last year sharing and getting inputs from a lot of the people in this room. And then in November, we released the toolkit. Um, so Katie, you mentioned that uh, ASRH stakeholders were involved in the revision process. Uh, who are you talking about? So a, a lot of people were consulted and many of those people are in the room with us today, but let's see who is in the room. Okay, so let's get started. You have two questions in front of you in the poll. Please go ahead and answer them. First one is, where are you joining this launch from? Is it Africa, Asia and Oceania, Latin America, the Caribbean and South America, Europe, Middle East and North Africa, or North America? And the second question, what age group do you belong to? 10 to 19 years old, 20 to 34 years old, above 34 years old, or prefer not to answer? We'll just give people a few more seconds to answer. So 
So sign up, I just shared the results. Wow, so we have such a diverse group of people coming from all over the world and around 43% uh, are younger than 34 years old. So that's amazing. Yeah, this is awesome to see so many different regions and uh, age groups represented. To add to this, from our registration information, nearly half of the people who registered are from a youth-led or community-based organization. And the information from our registration and from the poll just now looks a lot like the diversity of people we saw during the revision process. So you'll see around 130 people were involved in directly revising the toolkit. And those people represented many different organizations, uh, around 75, and that ranged from sexual and reproductive health organizations and humanitarian and development fields, but also we consulted a number of people outside of SRH. Uh, we talked to child protection, education, food and livelihoods, gender-based violence, humanitarian operations and management, as well as mental health and cycle psychosocial support colleagues. And then you'll see the breakdown is a lot like our group today. Uh, we had 20% from that were regionally based staff, 12% that were field based, but the large majority were young people. And we wanted young people's voice to be at the forefront of our uh, 2020 toolkit. That's really amazing, uh, Katie. Um, there are some key themes in the toolkit. Um, before Katie uh, shares some of those themes, let's see if any of you know one of the guiding themes of the toolkit. So here's our next question for you. What is one of the guiding principles of the 2020 ASRH toolkit? Tokenism, meaningful participation, globalization, or construction? So I think that uh, most of our participants uh, have answered meaningful uh, participation. That's the vast majority and only 4% answered globalization. So it looks like a lot of people are familiar with meaningful participation. That's great. And it is one of the key guiding principles of the 2020 toolkit. Um, another of the themes of the toolkit is the promotion of holistic integrated ASRH activities. So shifting away from just thinking about SRH as a health um, program or health activities, but thinking about it as something that you can integrate across the humanitarian response. And then we also added two new chapters to the 2020 toolkit, one on data for action, and then another one on manager guidance and tools. But all of this, uh, all of the revision that we did to the 2020 toolkit aligns with the interagency field manual, which was updated in 2018, as well as best practices and um, how to scale up ASRH programs in humanitarian settings. So how do you use the 2020 toolkit? We have a roadmap. It probably looks a lot like the slide that you saw from Oko and uh, Grace and Maziko. But this roadmap helps give you a layout of how the different chapters are arranged. They each have their own color and they each have different breakout boxes to help you with key messages, implementation considerations, and case studies. And we arrange the chapters to build on each other, which I'll get to in a moment. Some helpful tips for using the toolkit. Everything is online. In that uh, link that I shared earlier, you'll be able to find all of the toolkit chapters. It is quite a large document, so you can download each of the chapters individually. There are hyperlinks also throughout the toolkit, so you can easily navigate from one chapter or one table or one tool to another. And then all of the Annex tools that we have are available in PDF, but they are also available in Word and Excel so that you can edit adapt and start using the tools immediately. I'm going to give you a quick preview of each of the chapters, but don't worry if you don't understand everything in each chapter. You'll be talking about two chapters specifically in your breakout groups. 
But like I said, each of these chapters builds on each other and the two foundation chapters to our toolkit is the introduction and the uh, meaningful participation chapter. You all seem very familiar with meaningful participation. So that's a great start. Then we move into priority ASRH activities and emergency settings. And then we talk also about that key theme of holistic programming again in chapter five with going beyond health services. Most of the guidance and tools from the uh, toolkit are located in this chapter, chapter six. As you can see, there are a lot of different um, sections to this chapter, adolescent friendly services, training and capacity building, facility-based services, community-based services and outreach platforms, and multi-sector linkages and referral pathways. This is why we divided up chapter six into two different breakout groups. Chapter seven is another, um, large chapter and a new chapter for us. And this is on data for action. And then the other new chapter is manager guidance notes and tools. We have a very short chapter on the conclusion, as well as all of the annex tools and a very large resource table at the end that provides a short description and a link to all of the resources that are cited in the toolkit. That was a lot of information, Katie. Uh, you talked about a lot of different chapters, but let's see if the audience remembers which chapter has the majority of the toolkit's guidance and resources. Is it chapter three, meaningful participation? Chapter four, priority ASRH and emergencies activities? Chapter six, ASRH services and interventions? Or chapter seven, data for action? So we can see that 61% answered chapter six, and then a good 21% answered chapter four, and then a bit less answered chapter three and chapter seven. So many of you got the right answer. Congratulations. It is chapter six, but if you're still unsure which chapter talks about which topics, that's okay. In your breakout groups, you'll be talking in more detail about two of the chapters with your youth moderators. And when they begin that conversation, the youth moderators will be asking you about some common problems and issues that adolescents face in emergency settings, no matter what region they are living in. And now for the last question, what are some of the issues facing adolescents in humanitarian settings? Loss of support system, disruptions to education and health services, increased risk of sexual violence and abuse, or taking on adult responsibilities. So we can see that um, most of you chose more than one um, answer, and that that's right. As you can see, all of the responses are issues adolescents face in humanitarian settings. Uh, though the the one that you chose the most was increased risk of sexual violence and abuse. Yeah, that's right. There are so many issues that adolescents face, and we'll be talking about that more in your breakout groups. So we will be opening up the breakout groups right now. I am going to allow all of you to unmute yourself so that you can fully participate in your breakout groups. Just as a reminder, you have eight different options for breakout groups. All of the breakout groups will be using just one language. So if you do need French, Arabic, 
or Spanish, please choose the correct room. And you should see the breakout room option on your screen right now. Please choose a room. And if you don't choose a room, we Hi all, sorry about the cutoff there. We have opened the breakout rooms. You should see the breakout room options on the bottom right hand side of your screen. You're able to join the correct room associated with a region or language that is of interest to you. If you have any issues, please feel free to write in the chat or message me directly and I'm happy to get you set up. Thanks everybody, looks like some people are having issues. Give me one second, we'll get this sorted out. Thanks everybody for your patience. We are going to try that again um, and open the breakout rooms. The facilitators should be back in the session now and you will be able to choose your breakout rooms. You'll see on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, a little globe once I open this. Again, if you have any issues, just chat us and sorry for the technical difficulties. Breakout rooms have been open and I do see people joining. If for some reason you're having issues, please check the bottom right hand corner of your screen on Zoom. You should have a breakout room button. I'll give everyone a few minutes and anybody who's been unassigned, we will automatically assign you. If you have a preferred breakout room, just let me know in the chat if you're having issues and I will assign you to that room. Thank you. Thanks everyone, I see all of your chats. I'm slowly assigning you. Thanks for the patience.
Hello everyone, if you're just joining us, we are in our breakout room sessions. You'll be able to join a breakout room by going to the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom screen, clicking on the more option and selecting breakout room. If you have any issues, just let me know in the chat and I will assign you.